My main goal in this video is to talk about your Unit 2 project and demonstrate how some of these tasks can be accomplished on Desmos. So I'm going to be using my Desmos calculator. I'm already logged into it. I'm at desmos.com and I've clicked on the graphing calculator button. Okay, I'm just going to pull that off my screen for a moment and I'll bring it back when I'm ready to talk about it. To complete this project, you need to gather your own data. I'm not going to gather data for this project. Instead, in this demonstration, I'm going to use other data to answer some of the same questions. So you do need to gather your data, make your table. What I am going to talk about is going to be determining a model of best fit, identifying the parameters of the model, and making some of the predictions that you'll need to do for the model. All right, so the first, let me move my calculator back. The first uh, data set I'm going to grab is just this data right here on years and prisoners. It's just a data set I had available from a different class. So I'm going to grab uh, this data. Now, this has not yet been time scaled. So I'm going to time scale this and count my years as years since 1985, which is the first year in my table. So when I start my chart, I'm going to start with zero. Then 1990 is five years since, 1995 is 10 years past 1985, then 15 years past. Now notice it does not go to 2005, it goes to 2004, so instead of 20 years, it's going to be 19 years past. So we can confirm that because we know that 2004 minus 1985 is a period of 19 years. That difference can help us confirm that we're getting the right value in our input column of the table. So we go ahead and just enter these values. Obviously, when you do your project, you're going to be finding your values a much different way than I'm grabbing these from the worksheet, but I want to give an example of the other aspects of the project. Okay, so first thing I will do once I have my uh, table entered, let me just enlarge in my graph here, will be to zoom over on the data. So I'm going to use the zoom fit button, take a look at my data. And then I'm going to determine what type of model will best fit this data. One of the ways I can do that is by trying to find both a linear model and an exponential model, since those are the two modeling types that we are focused on right now at this point in our course. So I'm going to attempt a linear model. And I know that a linear model is of the form y equals mx plus b. So I'm going to make myself a note, linear has form y equals m x plus b. But to do the regression statement, we know that we have to tell Desmos, the calculator, where our y values and our x values are. So our y values and x values are in this table. In this table, they're noted as y1 and x1. So I'm going to type y1 to give the location of the y values. And since we're doing regression, which is an approximation, I'm going to use the tilde key in place of the equals key here. And then I'll use my mx1 to match the x label up here, plus b. So it's very similar to y equals mx plus b with those three changes to make it a regression statement instead of the generic form for a line. Okay, so there's my line. And... It looks pretty good. It's getting close to the points. Uh, that's what we want to see is that we want to get close to the points and that we have a fairly high correlation coefficient. Our correlation coefficient value for R squared is going to be 0 0.98, which is close to 1. So that's not a bad number. We want uh, something that's close to 1. Anything in the 0.9s is considered to be a very strong fit. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that linear is the best fit. So we're going to also check exponential. All right, so I know that an exponential model is of the form y equals a times b to the x. So we make those same regression changes. Instead of y, we're going to use y1 because that's where our data is. We're going to use tilde instead of the equal sign so that we can approximate our model. Then a, b to the, our data is in the x1 column. So this is our model. To be able to see this one better, I'm going to turn off the linear model for a moment so I can look at just the exponential model right here. And then we'll go back and compare those. So when I looked at the linear model, I said that was pretty good because I saw 
closeness between my dots where it didn't seem to be diverging away from them. It seemed to be close to them. Now it is closer to a few of them than it is to others, that's normal. And it had that nice high R squared value. When I look at the exponential model, we can look at this both with and without log mode. When I look at it first without the log mode button being checked, I can see that it has a little bit more divergence from the points, a little bit more variation where it doesn't seem to be following the trend of my points quite as well. Now it still has a very high R squared value of 0.93. So if I had not done the linear for the comparison, I might've been like, hey, that's not too bad. I could use this nice exponential, but the linear is a little better. If we turn the log mode button on, we'll see that there is not a lot of change. Uh, it gets us closer to the first two points, even to this fourth one over here, but then it's consequently further away from the last point. So it's not helping make it better in terms of the fit. It's still not, uh, what I wanna say is that the exponential graph has a curve to it, and that curve is not demonstrated by the data. If I turn this model off, would I expect this data to have a curve that would follow the exponential shape? And I don't. It's mostly straight. If anything, I would see a curve that went down from these last two points because this increase at the end here is not quite as large as the previous increases. So the exponential trend showing a larger increase at the end does not follow with what we see in the data. So based on the imagery and on the lower R squared value for exponential, we are going to select a linear model for this data. So I would show my work on both of these and then I would write a note that the linear model fits the data best, uh, both in shape, and oh, with a higher R squared value. Okay, so that is my reason that I'm going to choose a linear model. Now we're actually gonna write down the equation. So this did the work of helping us identify the parameters for the equation. Most of the time I, I'm going to write them down with three places so I can see my M value and my B value here. So we'll write down our linear equation as y equals 48.265x plus 479.601. Oops, I hit the wrong key instead of the decimal place there. There we go, uh, 0.601. Okay, so we should see that the red line as I just typed it is now on top of the green line so that I've typed it correctly. And now I have the model. So if I flip back to my project page for a moment, uh, when it asks us to determine a model of best fit and round to three place values, there were a lot of things that I had to do in order to be able to do that task. All of these. I determined the model of best fit. I determined that it was linear. I stated why I believe that linear is the model of best fit. And then I stated my model to three places. That's all step two. Okay. Now, uh, the next thing that we would need to do is identify the parameters of the model and use them in sentences. Okay, so in this case, this example over here, my data was in years and number of male prisoners in thousands. So to keep that in my mind, I'm going to go ahead and put the labels on my graph. So these were in years since 1985. That's the year I chose as my start. And these were number of male prisoners in thousands. Okay, 
So I, I should have done that earlier, but I've at least now labeled my graph appropriately so I can see what the units are on both of my axes. I'm going to need that information when I go to define the parameters. Parameters are the numbers in the equation. You can see my parameters for my linear are the slope and the intercept. We use the word parameters because they're more general. They are used for either case. The, the parameters are slope and y-intercept for linear, or they are y-intercept and growth factor for exponential. But of course, we're going to be using our linear parameters right here. So we need to explain both these numbers in sentences. So we'll start with our slope, and we'll say that the first parameter, m equals 48.265, tells us that, okay, the output, which in this case is the number of male prisoners, is, it's a positive value, so we are increasing by how much? By 40.265 units, thousand prisoners per, and now, now that I've done my output units, I'll say per my input units per year. You can say per year since 1985 or just per year right here in general is fine. Okay, That gives me the first parameter and what it tells us. So I've interpreted parameter one. Now I need to interpret parameter two. So the B value of four, uh, oops, I needed to put that in a note. The B value of 479.601 is related to the y-intercept, and I need to talk about what the 0 and the 479.601 are. Okay, so I'm going to mention that first. The b value is related to the y-intercept of 0, comma, this number. And this tells us that in zero, okay, so zero is my x coordinate, that is the number of years since 1985. So it means in 1985 itself, there were 479.601 thousand male prisoners. All right, so we have done the interpret the parameters piece for this situation. You will, of course, make sure that when you interpret your parameters, you think about what your, your output units are and what your input units are so that you can put in the appropriate phrasing. All right, back to my project uh, just to take a look at what we've done so far. So we've done a model of best fit. We have identified the parameters and interpreted them in context. Uh, now we need to make a prediction. So you're going to make a prediction for two weeks after the dates listed in the table. I'll make a prediction for two years after, let's say. And then uh, a comparison. Okay. So back to my model over here. Um, <clears throat> so if I want to make a prediction for two years after the end of my table, my table went out to 19 years. You're going to do two weeks, of course, not two years. But I'll make mine for 21 as the input value. So I'm two years past the end, just to do something sort of similar. And that's a year value. So I'm going to make my prediction with x equals 21. I'm going to locate that point of intersection. 21 comma 1493.17. So I'm going to write that down. 21 comma 1493.17. I'm going to turn the label on so I can see the coordinates of that point there. Okay. Now I need to state a full sentence that's going to explain what this means, so I'm making another note. I'm hitting the quotation mark key on my keyboard to make these notes. Uh, you may also click on the note icon if you're more comfortable to use the add item button than the keyboard hotkeys, that's fine. So I'm going to enter my note here to explain what this means. 21 is the number of years since 1985. So if I take 1985 and add those 21 years on, we're going to be in 2006. So that's how I'm going to start my sentence. I can even keep that work up there. I'm going to start with in 2006, there were, and then my output is 
fourteen thousand nine hundred or ninety three fourteen hundred ninety three point one seven thousand uh, male prisoners. All right. Now I don't have an actual value to compare this with, like you will. But if I did, I could look that value up and then compute my error or relative error using the formulas from section 1.5. So I'm going to stop on this part right here now that we have an idea on how to first make the model and decide which model type and then how to interpret the parameters and make a prediction. All right, so I'm going to look at another data set just for another example of something similar to this. I'm going to grab... Um, this data set here, I've already started kind of filling out this table because it needed to be shortened. These values were very large. So we're working on some debt values here. Uh, so we're going to use years since 1950. So as you can see, I've already turned that into a zero, 1951 into a one. Then they don't go up by one. So I'm going to count carefully. This is 17 years, which is 1950. This is 34. If I take 1998 minus 1950, that's going to be 48 years since uh, this one's going to be 62 years since 2012 minus 1950 and then 2018 is going to be 68 years since because these debt numbers are so large we're just going to round them to the nearest billion and so I the billions are 257 billion I went ahead and kept one place right here so 257.4 billion as you can see 255.2 billion Oops, I went one farther on the highlight there, but you got the idea. And I'm going to continue. Uh, we're still in the billions. So I'm going to go for here with the unit of billion to 1,572.3 billion. I'm rounding because of the two and the six after it. This next one's going to be 5,526.2 billion. 16,066.2 billion and 21,516.1, rounding that uh, 0 0.5 up to 0.1 billion. Okay, so I'm going to enter the years and the debt. And again, this is just a worksheet that I had from a different source, just to it once more practice these same ideas using. Uh, new data. So we're going to try it again. Oops, I don't want to make it bigger. I want to make that smaller. Let me take it over here. I'm going to insert a table and type this info in real quick. I like to just do my years first here. And apologize for watching me type this. I need to get in my debt value. One more, last one, that 21,516.1. All right, now that I got those values entered, let me go ahead and zoom fit on that data. And we are going to look at this data and try to determine if a linear model or an exponential model is going to be a better fit. So we're gonna do our linear model first. So as we remember from the last time, y1 approximately mx1 plus b. Since I opened up a new tab, I am using x1 and y1 for this data. Those are my data labels. So I make sure that I have the matching data labels in my regression statement. y1 approximately mx1 plus b. So there's the line. Okay. Uh, it's not great. A line's not going to fit this great. It has a 0.8 r value, which is not horrible, but I don't see the pattern of the data right here. When we take a look at our exponential, y1 approximately a, b to the x1, we should hopefully see a lot better correlation where we see that the pattern that we see in the data, it's a curved pattern and our exponential function is following that curve. 
Okay. So between the combination of the exponential function following the curve that we see the data displaying and the fact that the exponential function has a higher R squared value, considerably higher in this case, 0 0.9955 versus 0 0.8262, we're going to go with exponential for our choice. So this is currently displayed without the log mode button being clicked. We're going to make a decision on whether or not we want to click it. I know if you're working in Alex or my math lab, or you're working in a software system, they're going to require that you click it because that this option is not available on the calculator, it just is default clicked. So let's just take a look at what happens if we check the box and decide if we want to have the box checked or unchecked. So one of the things I notice is that the R squared value drops a little from 0.995 to 0.968. So the R squared value does decrease a little bit with a log button checked. But when I'm watching the data, I also see that I get a little closer to this particular point. So it's going to be a combination of visual fit and uh, what you need on this one. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it checked because I, I think that that maintains the fit on almost all the other points, hits this guy a little better. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it checked here. Um, sometimes you may decide to not leave it checked if you're working on a project or something similar where you don't need to enter your answer into a different piece of software where the button has to be checked. So I'm leaving it unchecked here. Oh, sorry, leaving it checked, I said, because I hit that point, I liked the way that looked. So it is subjective a little bit on how you like the fit. The R squared value is a little lower, still very strong at 0.968. Okay, so uh, the first thing I need to say is that we're going to choose an exponential model. So the exponential model fits better because visually it uh, fits the curve shown by the data. That's our visual aspect. And because it has a higher R squared value. Sometimes we, they ask us to spell this out so we can actually say that higher R squared value at 0 0.968. Uh, Sometimes we're asked to include the value. I think in one of the questions it says, Make sure you include the value in your, in your answer. So I'll just put it in this one. I forgot to do the last one. Okay, so I have looked at both. I have chosen which model I would like to use here. And then now I'm going to write my model. So I'm going with exponential. So I'm going to do y equals. I'm choosing to use the exponential parameters. So the 212.14 for a times b, which is... 1.07, we usually round to three places on these. I forgot the other one there somehow, an accident. So I don't know, just that little one didn't get typed there. Uh, I was going for my third place here. That was supposed to be a seven. Okay, I'm <laughs> going for my third place here. That's the one. Maybe I just didn't hit the seven key correctly. That's where the one was going to be for that third place because of the zero, run it up to the six. And then raised to the X. Remembering that our form is y equals a times b to the x. Uh, you may have seen me write this before with parentheses instead of the multiplication with the dot. Doesn't matter. So you can write it either way. Okay, so we got our model. Uh, I will note that on the exponential, there's a slight difference. I can see the red curve and the green curve as separate. And the slight difference is based on the rounding here. So if you want a little more accuracy in your picture and you don't want to see the difference between those, you can remove some of the error by choosing to keep more places here. So I can do 1.0707. I just went for four places. So I still rounded a little bit here. But now I can't see the difference between the red and the green lines, at least in this viewing window. So that could be an improvement. I don't want to see a large difference between the regression model and the equation that we're writing. Okay, so there we go. Uh, making predictions. Okay, so 
this was still in years, I believe. So one of our questions asked to make some predictions for years after or weeks after. So I'm going to make a prediction for years after. So let's pretend in mine that I make a prediction for, let's just go for 2022. So I'm going to make a prediction for, or 2019, just uh, because I think the project asks you to do 2019 in one of them. So um, <clears throat> we'll do that. Now I need to figure out how many years 2019 has been since my starting year. My starting year was 1950. In task two of the project, your starting year is going to be all over the place. It may not be 1950. Like you have different starting years. But if that was my starting year, 1950, and I want to make a prediction for 2019, then I'm going to be using 69 as my year value. I should put my labels on here. I forgot to do that. Sometimes I wait until the end to do that. On mine, this is years since 1950. And this is the uh, federal debt in billions. Those are the units I was working on for this example. Okay, so years since 1950 is across the x-axis. So we're doing an x equals 69. We're going to locate that ordered pair, 69 comma 23,563. And then I forgot what it was. I'm going to turn this off for just a quick second. Uh, 0 0.805. I just couldn't remember all of that number. And then I will turn the point and its label back on. All right. Now the interpretation piece. So the x equals 69 in this case refers to in 2019, right? Since we're 69 years past 1950, that would be in the year 2019. The federal debt was the example here was 23,563.805 billion dollars. Or I like to upscale. So instead of 23,000 billion, I can move my decimal place three spots. And I'm going to have to round that to a four here. I can say it was 23.564 trillion dollars. So that's just an opportunity to upscale because it's less standard to say 23,000 billion than it is to say 23.56 trillion. This is just the more common way to say a number that large. All right. Last thing to do, I can do this on both of them, I'll do this example first, is sometimes we have to make a prediction with an output value rather than an input value. So when I move on to my second prediction, I'm going to turn off the line that I used for the first prediction. I'm going to leave the dot there because that helps me identify where that point was. But let's say I wanted to predict when the debt would reach 30000 billion or any value that is asked, right? I'm going to just pick this one. Okay, so let's say my question next would be, when uh, will the debt reach? Uh, we'll go with 30 trillion or 30,000 billion. Okay, so because that is now an output value, that's the debt is in billions, we're going to graph that with a y equals instead of with an x equals. We're still going to locate our point of intersection. It's at 72.538. So I'm going to graph that. 72.538 comma 30,000. Turn my label for that point on there. And then I can get a sentence to express what that means. I know that the 30 thousand in the output coordinate corresponds to the 30,000 billion or 30 trillion dollars. And I know that the 72.568 corresponds to the number of years since 1950. So if I take 1950 and add on the 72.538, it's going to put me halfway through 2022. 
So we can say in, oops, I need a note. In uh, mid-2022, the we wouldn't use it 2022.5. That wouldn't be how we would casually phrase a year value. But I could say in mid-2022, the federal debt will reach or since we're past 2022 by now, you can say has reached, but it's the projection. So I can say will reach our uh, output value of 30 trillion. Okay. So I'm going to go back real quick to my linear model, just as a similar example, since I, I didn't remember to do both an input and output prediction. For those, I, on my linear model over here, I made an input prediction to figure out when, how many prisoners there were after two more years. Let's say I wanted to find out when there were a thousand male prisoners. Sometimes we'll make predictions that are within the data set. Sometimes we'll make predictions for values past. So let's just say I wanted to make an interpolation prediction this time. So I'm going to ask when were there a thousand male. Uh, so actually that's a thousand thousand because of the units here male prisoners. So technically a million, a thousand, thousands, a million, right? Uh, when were there a thousand male, thousand male prisoners? So that would be an output value of a thousand. So a thousand, thousand, or a million, and just parentheses there so that thousand, thousand doesn't seem so weird. Uh, I graph that and I'll give it a poke. 10.782, so I'm going to write that as an ordered pair, 10.782 comma thousand, label it, and then I can turn that line off now that I don't need to see anymore, and I can write my sentence about what this means. 10.782 is the input value, the x value, that's the number of years since 1985 here, so 1985 plus 10.782. Eight two would put us in late 1995. So in a note, I'm going to write in late 1995. Uh, there were a thousand thousand, which sounds very awkward, or you could say a million. Uh, male prisoners. All right. So just wanted to share these two examples. I grabbed a data set that had a graph where it turned out that linear was the best choice here. And I grabbed another data set where it turned out that after we checked both of the models, that exponential was the best choice. For all parts of your project, you're going to need to graph your data and you're going to need to make a choice about which is best. I'm going to go out of order here again. I just realized I did not identify the parameters and interpret them in my exponential case. So I want to go back and do that. I talked about which model fit better and I went right to my prediction. So let's do parameters. Okay. We practice parameters for linear. Now I want to practice those parameters again for exponential. Okay. So the A value of 212.141 in exponential, I'm gonna talk about the A value and the B value. For exponential, the A value is the Y coordinate of your Y intercept, means that zero comma 212.141 is the y-intercept. Now, that is not the interpretation piece. That's the first part of the significance of that value. That's our identify, identification of the parameter. We identified what it stands for. Now we're going to interpret it in context. So this means, what does the zero stand for? The zero stands for zero years past your starting year, which is 1950. This means that in 1950, there were, or nope, this wasn't about prisoners, this is about debt. Okay, so the uh, federal debt was about 
uh, two, let me put a dollar sign in front of that, 212.141 billion dollars. Okay, so putting my units on this, it's the federal debt, that's what it is, it's in billions of dollars. Okay, now that is very likely not the actual debt because there's going to be some error anytime you make a model, but it is what the model projects for that debt. That is the interpretation of that value. It's the projection from the model. Okay, next note, the B value of 1.0707 is the growth factor. When I write my sentence, I'm going to want the associated growth rate. So I'm gonna go ahead and state the growth rate here as well. The growth rate is the 1.0707 is above 100% by the 0 0.07, so it's 0. 707 or 7.07%, right? Now we're going to write about this in a sentence. This means that the federal debt is increasing. It's increasing because your growth factor, the base, is a value that is larger than 1. And so it's increasing by the growth rate, which is 7.07% per year. Again, because years, each of these tick marks in the bottom of the scale indicates years. All right, so I think I got all of the elements covered, not necessarily in the right order that we need, but again, we've talked about how to select your model. We're going to write the model. We're going to interpret our parameters, and we need to be able to make predictions, both for input values and for output values. There are a couple other elements like calculating percent error and calculating error. Those deal with chapter one, so I'm not going to review those specifically in this video. But we've got all the elements now, figuring out a model type, and then making some predictions about it. Okay. I hope that helps you with your project two, and if you have any further questions, send them my way. Thanks.